Shalom and welcome to Nehla Raglai Jewish Ministries, where we teach the Bible from a Jewish historical, cultural, and linguistic perspective. Today's teaching is on Daniel chapter 3, and I've titled this teaching, The Battle of the Gods. Let's just begin with a few questions before we get into the text of Daniel 3. First of all, what is the context of this chapter? When did it take place? Is Daniel chapter 3 prophetic or simply historic. And then a more personal question, have you ever been in a situation where you have had to choose between obeying the governing authorities or obeying Almighty God? So I want us to be thinking about these questions as we go through um, this teaching today and hopefully it will become clear um, as we go through the text of Daniel 3 and see how it applies to our lives today. So Daniel 3, verse 1. Here we go. Nebuchadnezzar the king made an image of gold, the height of which was 60 cubits, and its width 6 cubits. He set it up on the plain of Dora in the province of Babylon. Nebuchadnezzar the king also sent word to assemble the satraps, the prefects, and the governors, the counselors, the chief treasurers, the judges, the magistrates, and all the administrators of the provinces to come to the dedication of the image that Nebuchadnezzar the king had set up. Then the satraps, the prefects, and the governors, the counselors, the chief treasurers, the judges, the magistrates, and all the administrators of the provinces were assembled for the dedication of the image that Nebuchadnezzar the king had set up. And they stood before the image that Nebuchadnezzar had set up. Then the herald loudly proclaim, To you the command is given, you peoples, nations, and populations of all languages, that at the moment you hear the sound of the horn, flute, lyre, trigon, psaltery, bagpipe, and all kinds of musical instruments, you are to fall down and worship the golden image that Nebuchadnezzar the king has set up. But whoever does not fall down and worship shall immediately be thrown into the middle of a furnace of blazing fire. So we're all familiar with this story of the image of gold. But let's just talk about some of the um, details here. So first of all, the word for uh, image in Daniel 3 is the same as in Daniel 2, the Aramaic word tselem, which means image, right? So it just means some kind of image. Now the dimensions of this golden image are given here in the text. It is 60 cubits by six cubits. And translated into um, our measurements today, it's equivalent to 90 feet by nine feet or 30 by three meters, right? So that is the general dimension. So what did this image actually look like? Um, it could have been something like the images uh, on the screen here, something uh, tall and uh, narrow, right? because that's according to the dimensions. Um, so again, it's just something very tall and narrow, and it's an image of gold with these dimensions, basically 90 feet by 9 feet or 30 meters by 3 meters. It's very tall. So why would Nebuchadnezzar make an image of gold of this stature, of this size? We know that Nebuchadnezzar received a dream in his second year regarding the, the image where he was the head of gold and Daniel called him the king of kings. Now, pride and self-glorification are good possibilities for why Nebuchadnezzar made this image of gold, right? It was honoring himself. It's possible that the image was more like an obelisk, which is a... Um, which recorded the military victories of the king. This is something that was very common um, in, in that time. So since all of the officials of the kingdom of Babylon were called together to worship the golden image, it appears to have both a political and religious connection. This image of gold seems to be communicating a particular message, which is something like this. Now, this is not something quoted in a text, right? This is something I am um, giving context to. This is what it seems to be saying. 
quote, Nebuchadnezzar has conquered the world and he is the king of kings. Honor the king and worship the gods of Babylon, right? That's, this is what it seems to be communicating, this type of message. So what is the context of this chapter? When did it take place? Since the three main characters, Shadrach, Meshach, and Evidnego, uh, are working in their positions in the kingdom, as, we, as is recorded in uh, verse 12, we can obviously place this chapter in sequential order after chapters 1 and 2. Now, how much later was it uh, than the second year of the king, of King Nebuchadnezzar, in Daniel chapter 2? It's not specifically mentioned here. However, there is a hint. In the Septuagint, which is the Greek translation of the Hebrew text, we read the following. And it says this, In his 18th year, Nebuchadnezzar the king made a golden image. Its height was 60 cubits, its breadth 6 cubits, and he set it up in the plain of Dora in the province of Babylon. Right? So that's Daniel 3.1. It's the same thing. This is just from the Septuagint, right? Now, this is obviously the English translation of the Greek, um, but there it mentions the 18th year. Um, and we often look to the Septuagint because it was, uh, you know, translated um, from anywhere from 2,200 to um, about 2,000 years ago. And so it's much closer to the original time, right? So it adds some information here um, that it was the 18th year of King Nebuchadnezzar. Now, as we saw in Daniel 1.1, the Babylonian reckoning of years is generally one year less than the way others count years because of what we call the year of ascension, right? That first year that a um, Babylonian king uh, goes to the throne, it's not counted in his years. So therefore, this would be the 19th year of King Nebuchadnezzar, according to the he Hebrew or Jewish rendering of kings, which corresponds to the year Jerusalem was destroyed, as we read in the prophet Jeremiah. We read this in Jeremiah chapter 52. Now, on the 10th day of the fifth month, which was the 19th year of King Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, Nebuzaradan, the captain of the bodyguard who was in the service of the king of Babylon, came to Jerusalem and he burned the house of the Lord, the king's house, and all, of, all the houses of Jerusalem. Even every large house he burned with fire. So the entire army of the Chaldeans who were with the captain of the guard tore down all the walls around Jerusalem. So anyway, we're, we're focusing here on the timing, which is the 19th year of King Nebuchadnezzar. So Jerusalem and the temple were destroyed in 586 BCE, which is the 19th year of King Nebuchadnezzar, according to the uh, Hebrew or uh, Jewish culture, and it's the 18th year of King Nebuchadnezzar, according to the Babylonian culture. It's the same year. So, Putting the details together, it appears that the events in Daniel chapter 3 occurred uh, in 586 or, or 585 BCE after the destruction of Jerusalem, the city and temple of the God of the Hebrews. Nebuchadnezzar had every earthly reason to boast and take pride in his kingdom. The Chaldeans and their gods had been victorious over all the other nations, right? King Nebuchadnezzar had conquered all of that, all the nations in that Mesopotamian area, going all the way over uh, to the west, going all the way down to Egypt. Nebuchadnezzar probably understood the conquering of Jerusalem as a fulfillment to his dream as the head of the image of gold. Men love to build edifices, meaning a building or structure, to themselves and to their accomplishments. The command to bow down and worship the image was given to the government officials in his kingdom of every nation, people, and language, right? So this was a uh, universal command in his kingdom for all to come and bow down to this image in recognition of who he was as the king at that time. And as we read in the text, right, it, it's the command to fall down and worship. It wasn't simply just recognizing him as king. This was a religious act as well, right? And this phrase, fall down and worship, or fall down and do homage, in verse 5, it's the same language used in Daniel chapter 2, verse 46, when King Nebuchadnezzar 
fell down and did homage to Daniel after he had finished interpreting the dream, right? And to fall down and do homage is a physical demonstration of respect and honor, as we saw back in Daniel chapter 2. And in this situation, it was a sign of submitting and worshiping the image of gold that Nebuchadnezzar has set up. It is clarified later in the text that this act, in, act included worship of the Babylonian gods. As we read in the phrase, but whoever does not fall down and worship shall immediately be thrown into the middle of a furnace of blazing fire. Right? So this was the, the punishment, the penalty for disobedience is what we read here in Daniel 3, 6, that you would be burned alive in uh, a fire. Uh, a furnace of burning fire. So it's either worship the image or burn in the fiery furnace. Execution by burning was not a new method that Nebuchadnezzar had invented for this event. Nebuchadnezzar was known for execution by fire. We read this in Jeremiah 29 when God used Nebuchadnezzar to judge false prophets. Uh, false prophets. So we read this. Quote, this is what the Lord of armies, the God of Israel, says concerning Ahab, the son of Koliah, and concerning Zedekiah, the son of Messiah, who are prophesying to you falsely in my name. Behold, I am going to hand them over to Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, and he will kill them before your eyes. Because of them, a curse will be used by all, by all the exiles from Judah who are in Babylon, saying... Quote, may the Lord make you like Zedekiah and Ahab, whom the king of Babylon roasted in the fire. Unquote. Because they acted foolishly in Israel and committed adultery with their neighbors' wives and falsely spoke words in my name which I did not command them. I am he who knows and a witness, declares the Lord. So this is Jeremiah 29, 21 to 23. And we see how the Lord himself had used Nebuchadnezzar to bring judgment on false prophets in the land of Israel, uh, who were captives who were taken to Babylon, it appears. Now, this was a powerful judgment against false prophets. And we can remember how God sees everything, right? So sometimes we think that men are getting away with certain things. When I say men, people, right? Um, but we know how God sees everything and he brings everyone into account. Now, the authority of kings is absolute. Kings have the power to kill and let live. We see that even up till today. Nebuchadnezzar was using his authority to force all the officials in his kingdom to bow down and worship before the golden image that he had made. So we continue in the text to read about those who will accuse um, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego for not bowing down, right? So in verse 7 we read, Therefore, as soon as all the peoples heard the sound of the horn, flute, lyre, trigon, sultry, bagpipe, and all kinds of musical instruments, all the peoples, nations, and populations of all languages fell down and worshipped the golden image that Nebuchadnezzar the king had set up. For this reason, at that time, certain Chaldeans came forward and brought charges against the Jews. They began to speak and said to Nebuchadnezzar the king, O, queen, o king, live forever. You, O king, have made a decree that every person who hears the sound of the horn, flute, lyre, trigon, sultry, and bagpipe, and all kinds of musical instruments, is to fall down and worship the golden image. But whoever does not fall down and worship shall be thrown into the middle of of a furnace of blazing fire. There are certain Jews whom you have appointed over the administration of the province of Babylon, namely Shadrach, Meshach, and Evidnego. These men, O king, have disregarded you. They do not serve your gods, nor do they worship the golden image which you have set up. So here we have the accusation set by these certain men. So who were these accusers of the Jewish men. The text identifies them only as certain Chaldeans. So why would these Chaldeans, right, Babylonians, accuse these Jewish men? Were they protecting King Nebuchadnezzar? Was that their real motive? The most obvious reason is jealousy. Babylon was under the authority of King Nebuchadnezzar and the Chaldeans, right? The Chaldeans are the the Babylonians. These 
accusers were Chaldean, and they brought the accusation against these quote-unquote foreign Jews whom Nebuchadnezzar had appointed over the province of Babylon, right, together with Daniel. Now, Daniel was not included in this uh, accusation. Now, it was as if the accusers were saying, quote, see what happens when you place foreigners in positions of authority in our land. We also read the phrase, and they brought charges against the Jews. But I want to expand on that a little bit. This phrase is actually an idiom in Aramaic. And it's literally, it literally says, Ve'aklu kartzehun de Yehude. And literally reads, and they ate the pieces of the Jews. It's like the English expression, they tore them to pieces. right? And so that's what we actually read in the text uh, as they accuse the Jews for not worshiping these gods. The accusation was personal against these three Jewish officials, Shadrach, Meshach, and Evidnego, and directed towards the king, right? As they said, these men, O king, have disregarded you. So the, the accusers wanted, to, wanted, to, wanted Nebuchadnezzar to understand this is a personal attack against you, O king. And as they, as they say, they do not serve your gods, nor do they worship the golden image which you have set up. Right? They made it appear personal and an affront to Nebuchadnezzar, his gods, and his kingdom. And we must understand this. Evil men do not really care about the law. They only want to destroy the righteous. And they will use anything. And they will capitalize, right? Will make the most of any opportunity to say, look at these these people over here, they're not obeying the law of the land, and we need to punish them. We see this all the time in the world, and especially it's increasing in these days as there's more and more opposition to those who believe in the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, to those who believe in the Messiah, Yeshua, right? We're accused of not obeying the rules of the earthly leaders, the rules of the nation, because they want to, they want to, uh, they want to persecute us. They want us to pay a penalty. They want us to be taken away, extinguished. Evil men do not really care about the law. They only want to destroy the righteous. And they'll use the law for their own, for their own desires. So let's continue in the text in verse 13. Then Nebuchadnezzar, in rage and anger, gave orders to bring Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. Then these men were brought before the king. Nebuchadnezzar began speaking and said to them, Is it true, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, that you, you do not serve my gods, nor worship the golden image that I have set up? Now, if you are ready, at the moment you hear the sound of the horn, flute, lyre, tragan, psaltery, and bagpipe, and all kinds of musical instruments, to fall down and worship the image that I have made, very well. But if you do not worship, you will immediately be thrown into the midst of a furnace of blazing fire. And what God is there who can rescue you from my hands? Nebuchadnezzar wanted to know if these men were loyal to him and to his gods, right? So the question was really being proposed, whom do you worship and whom, whom do you serve and whom do you worship? Right? He wanted to know where their loyalty stands, where their loyalty stands. It's important to remember that these youth were now young men serving in the kingdom. They were, they were probably in their mid-30s, no longer children or youth, right? It's, it's Nebuchadnezzar's um, you know, 19th year. They, they've been in Babylon for approximately 19 years, and they were... They were middle-aged men who were standing before the king. They were in a pagan society, and they were being confronted with their faith and their loyalty. Were they serving the king, first and foremost, or were they serving their own god and the, the nation they came from? In that culture, it was, it was also a battle of the gods, the god the gods of Nebuchadnezzar against the God of the Jews, right? The God of the Hebrews, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Nebuchadnezzar considered all gods to be subservient to his gods since he was the king of the world at that time. Who could then challenge him? What god was left in the world to defeat his 
gods. This is how Nebuchadnezzar thought. Nebuchadnezzar believed that the gods had anointed him for this time. And we see evidence of that outside of the text in something that we read um, from the very city of ancient Babylon, an inscription from the Ishtar Gate, right? And we read these very words of Nebuchadnezzar himself. And this is from uh, architectural, or, or not architectural, but um, from archaeology, right? These are actual cuneiform findings. And we read this. Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, the pious prince appointed by the will of Marduk, the highest priestly prince, beloved of Nabu, of prudent deliberation, who has learnt to embrace wisdom, who fathomed their, Marduk and Nabu, godly being, and pays reverence to their majesty, the untiring governor, who always has at heart the care of the cult of Asagila and Azida, and is constantly concerned with the well-being of Babylon and Borsipa, the wise, the humble, the caretaker of Asagila and Azida, the firstborn son of Nabupalazar, the king of Babylon, am I. Right, so this is a, a statement from Nebuchadnezzar declaring his lo loyalty to his gods and humbly stating how he is this great king. Nebuchadnezzar was a proud king who believed that the gods were for him. He is communicating to his gods even in this inscription, inscription that we read, right? And he's, he's literally saying, and what god is there who can rescue you, these three Jewish men, from my hands, right? In his mind, all the gods were on his side. And their god, back in Jerusalem, had been destroyed by Nebuchadnezzar. So in his mind, his god was dead. That's how he understood it. And we need to understand the culture as well that continues in the Middle East and in the Asian world till today, right? According to various religions and pagan theologies, the gods rule the spiritual realm and they determine who will be king and who will rule the nations. And I want to even bring this even closer to where I am here in Israel in the Middle East, right? We have this whole situation of Islam and the quote-unquote problem of Israel. According to Islamic theology, a Jewish state, the state of Israel, uh, established in a land that was once controlled by Muslims is an affront to their faith. It is a problem in Islamic theology. This is why many Muslim nations have not recognized the nation of Israel until recently. It's only in the last couple of years that we started to have Muslim nations that are coming out and saying that they will even recognize Israel as a nation. They were waiting for the nation of Israel to disappear. In their mind, Islam once controlled this land. It could never go back to another um, people, the Jews or the Christians especially. So after 73 years, Israel has only become more established and has grown in its territory and has shattered the Islamic prediction. And so the question, has the God of the Jews defeated the God of Islam? This is what even goes on today in the mind of Muslims. I'm just hoping that if you don't understand this already, this is how... Um, Muslims think. This is Islamic theology that continues until today. And this is, this is the mindset of Nebuchadnezzar back then. His God had destroyed the other gods and he was the ruling power, right? And so um, Nebuchadnezzar was asking the question, what God was strong enough to defeat his gods? In his arrogance, there was no God big enough or strong enough to deliver from his hands. All the gods had made him ruler over the nations, and he was the strong man of the earth. So then we continue in the text, and we read this. Shadrach, Meshach, and Evidnego replied to the king, Nebuchadnezzar, we are not in need of an answer to give you concerning this matter. If it be so, our God whom we serve is able to rescue us from the furnace of blazing fire, and he will rescue us from your hand, O king. But even if he does not, let it be known to you, O king, that we are not going to serve your gods nor worship the golden image that you have set up. So just take note of 
the tone in their response. It's actually very informal, very straightforward, and very confident through faith in God. And this is in contrast to the Chaldean accusers who greeted Nebuchadnezzar with a, a more formal and respectful tone when they said, O king, live forever. Right? The three Jewish men simply call him by his name, Nebuchadnezzar, we are not in need uh, of an answer to give you concerning this manner. And you, you see their confidence coming through here um, in their God, which was amazing to see at that time, right? And we read where they say, but even if he does not rescue us, right? Let it be known to you, O king, that we are not going to serve your gods nor worship the golden image that you have set up. They responded to the king in total confidence, according to their faith in tr and trust in God, no matter what. Even if they died, they said, we are sticking by our faith. And we read in Proverbs 29, 25, this um, beautiful proverb. The fear of man brings a snare, but one who trusts in the Lord will be protected. And I think we, we see the evidence of that in this particular um, incident in, uh, in Daniel 3, right? And as we continue, we, we read the outcome in verse 19, Daniel 3, 19. Then Nebuchadnezzar was filled with wrath, and his facial expression was changed towards Shadrach, Meshach, and Evidnego. He answered by giving orders to heat the furnace seven times more than it was usually heated. He ordered certain valiant warriors who were in his army to tie up Shadrach, Meshach, and Evidnego in order to throw them into the furnace of blazing fire. Then these men were tied up in their trousers, their coats, their caps, and their clothes, and were thrown into the middle of the furnace of blazing fire. For this reason, because the king's command was harsh and the furnace had been, extreme, had been made extremely hot, the flame of the fire killed those men who took up Shadrach, Meshach, and Evignego. But these three men, Shadrach, Meshach, and Evignego, fell into the middle of the fire of furnace of blazing fire, still tied up. Then Nebuchadnezzar the king was astounded and stood up quickly. He said to his counselors, Was it not three men that we threw bound into the middle of the fire? They replied to the king, Absolutely, O king. He responded, Look, I see four men untied and walking about in the middle of the fire unharmed, and the appearance of the fourth is like a son of the gods. The red, hot, the red hot anger of Nebuchadnezzar was matched by his demand to increase the intensity of the fire in the furnace seven times. Nebuchadnezzar did everything in his power to make sure that these three men and their faith in their God were extinguished. He chose his strong warriors to bind the three men fully clothed in order to throw them into the furnace. The result, the strong soldiers were killed by the heat of the furnace. The three Jewish men fell into the furnace and lived. The king was astounded by what he saw. We all know this story, but it's so incredible to see how the details of the story come together. The king said, was it not three men who were bound into the middle of the fire? And then the king responded by answering his own question. And he says, I see four men walking about in the middle of the fire unharmed. And the appearance of the fourth is like a son of the gods. Unbelievable miracle. A great miracle happened that day. God not only protected them from the heat of the furnace, but was with them in the flames. It is a fulfillment of what we read in Isaiah chapter 43, verse 2, which says, quote, When you pass through the waters, I will be with you, and through the rivers, they will not overflow you. When you walk through the fire, you will not be scorched, nor will the flame burn you. In Daniel 3.25, we read, 
Nebuchadnezzar's response, right? He responded, look, I see four men untied and walking about in the middle of the fire unharmed and the appearance, the appearance of the fourth is like a son of the gods. Now, the language to, to describe this fourth person is often translated as being like a son of the gods. And I just wanted just to explain it a little bit, right? So the Aramaic literally reads, Dame uh, labar lahin, and it literally is resembles a son of God or a son of the gods. Um, and I just want to explain a little bit more here. So this Aramaic expression, a son of God or a son of the gods, is only used here in this verse and is parallel to the Hebrew ben Elohim. We, I think we're probably all familiar with these words, right? Uh, ben meaning son and Elohim means God, meaning God, right? So son of God. So just to point out that the word Elohim, um, it's actually a plural form of the word El, right? El is singular, Elohim is the plural. Um, but it it's generally used either in a singular or plural form depending on how it's being used, right? If it's speaking of the one true God, we say God. And if it's speaking of, um, you know, false gods, idols, then it's, it's, it's used uh, in the plural form, gods. Um, so what did Nebuchadnezzar mean by this statement? You know, we don't know exactly. We can't read his mind. Um, but either way, he's expressing it in a miraculous way. And he's saying the fourth resembles a son of uh, of God, right? It was a supernatural being. And we had that um, confirmed because later in the text, he calls that supernatural being also an angel, right? So whether he's literally referring to like a theophany, an appearance of God there, or simply this other, this other one's like an angel, either way. So, the God of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego saved them from the fiery furnace and from the hands of Nebuchadnezzar. And the king, Nebuchadnezzar, was humbled and he quickly admitted it. He admitted defeat in this battle. As you read here in verses 26 to 27, then Nebuchadnezzar came near to the door of the furnace of blazing fire. He said, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, come out, you servants of the Most High God, and come here. Then Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego came out of the middle of the fire. The satraps, the prefects, and the governors, and the king's counselors gathered together and saw that the fire had no effect on the bodies of these men, nor was the hair of their heads singed nor were their trousers damaged, nor had even the smell of fire touched them. Nebuchadnezzar responded and said, Blessed be the God of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, who sent his angel and rescued his servants, who put their trust in him, violating the king's command, and surrendered their bodies rather than serve or worship any god except their own except their own God, right? What a testimony by Nebuchadnezzar. Therefore, I make a decree that any people, nation, or population of any language that speaks anything offensive against the God of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego shall be torn limb from limb and their houses made a rubbish heap because there is no other God who is able to save in this way. Then the king made Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego prosperous in the province of Babylon. That brings an end to chapter 3, right? Now, just as quickly as the king ordered the three Jewish men to be thrown into the fire, he called them out of the furnace and addressed them in a new manner, saying, You servants of the Most High God. So this Aramaic phrase is, Abduhu di Eloha Ela'a, and is literally servants of the Most High God. So as a result of this supernatural event, did Nebuchadnezzar become a follower of the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, a follower of the God of the Jews? Most likely not. However, the king recognized that the God of the Hebrews won this battle. The God of the Hebrews proved himself to be stronger than the gods of Babylon, and the king honored them and their God for this clear victory. The obvious miracle before the eyes of Nebuchadnezzar and his officials was confirmed not only by the deliverance of their bodies from the flames, but even the very fabric of their clothing was protected from even the smell of the fire. And just to mention too that this phrase violating the king's command in Aramaic is 
milat malka shaniv, and it's literally and changed the word of the king, right? Because they were def they were defying the word of the king. They were defying the edict of the king. Nebuchadnezzar admitted that they defied the king's command for the sake of their faith in the one God and willingly laid down their lives. The king honored Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego by promoting them in his kingdom and made an edict to protect their God. And again, I mentioned this is the end of Daniel chapter 3, but just to say that the Hebrew, the Hebrew text, or the Aramaic here, continues for another um, three verses, 31 to 33. And on the English, this is the equivalent to chapter 4, verses 1 to 3. Depending on the translation you're using, meaning if you have a German Bible or something else, it may be the, um, there may be the three more verses there in chapter 3. You know, either way, Chapters and verses are not uh, inspired by God, right? They are man-made, and it's just a way of finding the text. So I just want to point that out, though, depending on the translation you're using. Now, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego defied the king's command and risked their lives for the sake of their faith in God. And I just want to bring this practically home to each one of us. Have you ever been in a situation where you had to choose between obeying the governing authorities or obeying Almighty God? And I want to just share a personal story from my own life that has happened to me in the past um, year, year or two. Um, so I'm recording this in, um, in 2021, but when um, in this past year, we're in the middle of the pandemic, right? So in, um, in the fall of 2020, during the, the shutdowns, right, the, all of the closures of the pandemic, um, I'm living in Israel and the, the government was constantly making rules about, you know, how many people can be in a certain location, big gatherings. Um, and at certain times, it even affected how many people we could have in our own house or if we could even have uh, people outside of our home come into our home. And so in the fall of 2020, um, we were getting ready to celebrate Chag Sukkot, which is the Feast of Tabernacles, right? So we're talking about October 2020. And uh, I had built my, my sukkah, my tabernacle, my booth you know, on my balcony. And I had invited a few friends over. And it's outside. Um, but two days before the, the, the celebration, the government decided to limit who could come into one's home. And they even went so far as to say that no one from outside could enter into someone else's booth or tabernacle. We're outside. But they made this rule. So... Um, I was really perplexed. I was conflicted. What should we do? Um, should we meet together or should we not? I called the people I invited. They were all more than willing to still come. But me as the uh, host, should I host this event or not? I didn't want to disobey the governing authorities. I, I tried to obey authority as much as possible. Um, and I, I really felt like, you know, God has commanded us. He is He's given this as an appointed time. I don't feel like I have to keep it according to the law, but it's a beautiful thing to keep. And um, I felt like I, I wanted to do it, and I felt like it was something that God wanted us to, to enjoy and celebrate. Um, but I was conflicted. And so I spent, I only had about 48 hours to figure out what to do. So I was praying about it and asking God to give me some kind of uh, clarification. Should I have these people over in my house and defy the governing authorities, or should I simply submit and say no? And um, so I, I went through this time, and I, I didn't really hear anything. And by Friday morning, people were coming over that Friday evening. And I, um, I, I had my devotional time that morning. I was really expecting God to give me some kind of clarification, but I didn't really receive anything. And I always had my phone shut off at night. I turned my phone on after uh, my devotional time that morning, and I received a, a message, a text message from someone outside the country who had no idea what was going on or what I was thinking about. And this is the text message I received, this image to the left, this picture with the verse on it from Daniel 6.23, which said, So Daniel was taken up out of the den, and no kind of harm was found on him because he had trusted in his God. Right? And this was a friend who just sent me this to encourage and be, and be a blessing for the Sabbath. And I thought, this is beautiful. And God spoke to me through this text saying, trust in me, 
No harm will come to you. And that's what I did. So I had my friends over. We had a beautiful time of celebration together and no one got COVID. But uh, more than that, right? It's about when do we know when it's when we obey God or obey, obey man, right? When is it okay to, to not obey governing authorities? And these past two years of this, of this um, you know, as we go into 2022, right? So 2020, 2021, it's been these years of, of, um, of suppression by governments and of keeping us down. And we don't know sometimes what we should obey because of these governing rules, right? But we need to learn to hear from God and know when to obey, just like Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, and when to obey, uh, when to obey God or when to obey man, right? Fear of man will prove to be a snare, but whoever trusts in the Lord is kept safe. We need to obey governing authorities as much as possible, but when it conflicts with our faith, we have no other choice. But uh, may God give us each wisdom as we go forward in our walk of faith. This is the conclusion to Daniel 3, the battle of the gods. For um, preparation for the next teaching, please read Revelation chapter 13, and we're going to see, is there any prophetic connection to Daniel chapter 3? Thank you so much for being part of this teaching. If you're benefiting, please share these teachings with others, and I also wanted to encourage you to support our ministry uh, by going to our website, nailavergali.com, and give a donation of any amount to continue to allow us to teach God's Word from the Jewish historical, cultural, and linguistic perspective. Thank you. And see you again next time.